My name is Nick Denardis. I am the Director of Digital Communications at Wayne State University, which is a large public research institution in Detroit. Uh, we're primarily a commuter campus. We have about 26, 27,000 students, and so we, we kind of have the same struggles as a lot of other institutions out there. Um, I also organize a bunch of events, uh, specifically TEDx Detroit, Hyatt Web Michigan, Refresh Detroit, and I've now taken over the Laravel Detroit meetup uh, group. And then in my spare time, I also like to refinish hardwood floors. So, a little housekeeping. The slides are already online at this URL. I'll also put them up at SlideShare uh, with the hashtag of all this other stuff. So that way it's grouped in with the other conference presentations. Uh, the music prior to this talk uh, is also up online on 8Tracks. Uh, there is extra resources available at, um, actually, we'll, we'll see them here, but I'm gonna skip over them. Uh, I forgot to hide them, actually, before I started this. Uh, on the slides when you download them. So every kind of topic area has a bunch of links for more information, just because I'm gonna go through so much. It is being streamed and recorded, so if you have questions, I'm gonna throw you this thing, and hopefully you guys can pass it around, uh, which has a mic in it, and everyone online can hear your question, and um, that way you don't have to repeat everything. And so, show of hands, who in this room does development more than 50% of their day? Wow, okay, so that's like 80% of you. How many, Man, how many of you manage developers more than 50% of your day? Okay, oh, what, oh, one. All right, um, how many of you attend more than three hours of meetings on average per day? Oh, about 10, 20% here. Uh, who uses email as kind of their daily task list? All right, actually that's about 20%. Uh, and then who here is uh, involved in code reviews on a day-to-day -day basis or you know, pretty routine basis? All right, so that's about 20, 25%, which is good. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is not necessarily pieces, individual lines of code to go from kind of crufty code to quality code, but really the process of creating crafted quality code and how and whose responsibility that is and how to ensure that it's being uh, taken seriously and done on a day-to-day -day basis. So how did we end up with all this cruft in the first place? So uh, I'm gonna go through a number of different topic areas and like I said, there's resources for each uh, on the slides. And so for example, this is a floor that I recently redid. It was in a house that um, actually had eight kids, so there was 10 people living there uh, for about 30 years, right? That floor is very sturdy. It stood the test of time, but at the end of the day, you know, when you look at it objectively, it has a lot of cruft on it, and we're gonna go through kind of how to, to kind of clean that cruft up on an ongoing basis, and uh, it's not going to be an easy process, and it's not going to be an overnight change. And so these types of things uh, that I'm gonna talk about aren't something that you can immediately go back and change your entire team. It'll probably take about a year at the very least to get a good um, kind of team structure and getting code to what you would feel like is kind of craft worthy. How did we get into this situation? So, Obviously, if you create, have created any piece of software in the past, it's hard, right? There are lots of things in play here, right? There's lots of unknowns, lots of uh, client changes over time, technology changes over time, expectations change from the user's end, uh, time, money constraints, turnover, team morale, uh, development environments, and training. All of these things go into every piece of software that's produced, and you could also, you know, uh, attest to content that's produced and imagery and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, people who work on code, right, kind of classify themselves in one or two of these buckets, right? The developer, the person who is just kind of getting their tasks, figuring out what to do next, doing it, and moving on to the next thing. And the engineer, the, uh, the person who kind of really thinks about the longer term uh, of what these tasks are, what they mean, how they interact with each other, and kind of plan for that long-term future. Everybody wants to be an engineer, right? But if you have a whole team of engineers, who's doing the actual work? So what I'd like to go through is a little bit of a process to get everybody in the develop developer mindset, but as a whole, acting as kind of a big engineering team. 
we're going to start with project management, because that's probably how we got all this cruft in the first place, or at least one of the reasons, right? Or lack of project management. How many of you track your time right now? Okay, so about 40% of you, actually. Um, this is, if you don't do this right now, this is something that is a recommendation to start you know, when you get back to your job. Whether it's something that is mandated by your group or not, um, or if you're the only one doing it, it's really good context to see what you're spending your time on, right? At the end of the day, your time is your currency. Uh, where at my institution, my department is not completely generally funded. So we do charge for our services within the institution. For, you know, each school and college and department, we charge you know, per task at a specific dollar amount. Uh, and it allows us uh, to keep our staff and do what we do. It's an interesting model. It's not completely unique, but it works really well for us. That's not the case in every institution. A lot of you do have, you know, they are completely centrally funded, but at the end of the day, your time is limited, right? You only work seven and a half hours or so a day or, or, or whatever. What you work on is your currency. The more time, like on, on this one developer's kind of week here, you know, they spent almost eight hours on troubleshootings, two and a half hours in meetings, two and a quarter or, uh, hours on maintenance without agreement. They actually only did, a, you know, a handful of hours on actual back-end programming and, um, and professional development. And so knowing where you're at right now is the baseline to start improving for the future. Let's skip over those resources slides. Turnover. Turnover happens pretty highly in almost every environment. I feel like higher ed isn't you know, absolutely unique to this, uh, but we have a lot of student workers, right? So this going back to the same floor, uh, tearing up the carpeting, everything was looking good, get to one spot, notice these two funny looking boards, right? One of them is upside down. The other one isn't even the right board. It's just some random board that's in here. There's gaps on it and everything. So what I thought was gonna be a one day job to clean up uh, the floor ended up being a little bit more uh, complicated. So this happens often in your own environments and you may not even realize that. And it might be happening under your own kind of watch. Say you have two students on your team, right? Two student developers, and those students, you know, their their students are pretty good. But say they just Google a lot, they find stuff on Stack Overflow, you know, they just kind of take two shortcuts, say, in their code a week, right? So they work on average maybe 40 weeks out of the year because they're students, they have exams and junk. Uh, that's 80 shortcuts hidden in your code bases, you know, for an entire year. So now a client comes in, you need to make a change to something. You go in, oh, that's about a 10 minute change. You go look in your code, boom, you hit one of these landmines that you didn't expect. Now, what was gonna take 10 minutes, now is gonna take at least an hour to figure out what was going on and to actually refactor it. And so, what the goal of these processes are going to be to start talking about the code that's going into every code base before it actually officially makes it into that code base uh, to avoid these situations. In this case, documentation is key. Um, having documentation for every single project is important. For us, we have a repository for every project because we try to think of every, every site um, as its own unique thing, right? It has its own build. It has its own needs from a development standpoint and potentially, if this site needed to move off to a separate server or something like that, we want it to be as isolated as possible. Right now, our, our group oversees 550 to 600 individual websites. And so um, they each have their own unique needs. As we do a site, you know, the next few, we're gonna go on and we'll probably have a little bit different process 10 sites down the road, you know, 10 redesigns down the, down the road. We wanna make sure that you know, there is the documentation of, at this snapshot in time, how to build the site, how to deploy the site, how to make any specific changes. A little bit of help. Uh, one thing that has helped us a lot is like having a standard make file for every single site. So this is, uh, you know, old school make files, right? But they work. This is exactly what they were meant for. Uh, we have a standard API 
uh, that does you know, install, an update, a status, and a build around every project. So that way, if this site uses you know, Grunt, back when Grunt was you know, super hot, uh, that's fine. And another site nowadays uses you know, Gulp. Doesn't matter because the build is the same. The developer would just call make build, and whatever the process was at that time just works. They don't have to think about it. And that allows them to not have to dive into every code every single time they have to check out a new site and, and kind of figure, uh, get their bearings all over again, or, or what were we doing back you know, two years ago but when will we, will we were doing this site. And that helps their time on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and alleviate that troubleshooting kind of column and getting more and more time in the, in the actual development uh, you know, bucket. So team knowledge, right? So say, uh, and this is the case that I was in, with this, it wasn't just this one room that I was redoing. I actually redid all of the floors on the first level of this house. Uh, so the person uh, who actually was my mother-in-law, she really wanted a, a dark stain on these floors. I'd never done dark stain before on floors, so of course just Googled it, watched a ton of YouTube videos, figured it out, what I thought I figured it out, right? And uh, I started, doing one of these floors, and the, the first room, sanded it all, started putting down the stain, and something wasn't right. There was marks everywhere, stuff just did not feel right. And this was primarily because I did this all in isolation. I did this all, I, you know, I was almost too confident, and I tried to do this without consulting with somebody else who had done this in the past. And so uh, this is where you need to embrace your team and bring your team into an environment where you can talk to each other openly about code, about reviews, and new ideas and different processes without it feeling like just another meeting. And so the way that we started and the way that I recommend everyone start is not looking at your own code, but looking at somebody else's code, right? This is the first step into looking at code objectively. Uh, when it's not yours, it's easy to talk about, you know, oh, they should have done this this way, or why didn't they do that way, or hey, I never saw that before. Reading code is the easiest way to do that. And so, uh, for example here, I, I don't install hardware floors, but my brother-in-law does. I wasn't going to attempt to replace these two random boards. Uh, so I, brought, I enlisted his help uh, to come over and, and help me with this. I watched him, I asked questions, I listened to his answers. I, had no, I have no intention of ever installing hardwood floors. But I, and I could have gone to another room and been more efficient and done you know, some other task that I needed to do on another piece of the house, but I didn't. I sat there and I wanted to understand his point of view about why someone would have done it this way, how do these things interlock, and what the implications are of now that I'm gonna sand this, what, like, what is the, the difference? How do I need to interact with this a little bit differently? And so now I have that context in the future of how to then you know, interact with these interesting situations that come up. So there's a really good talk um, by Saran Yetberg, uh, I believe is her last name, about reading code. Uh, and this is in the resources uh, links. And she does. She, you know, it's a full talk specifically about reading code, uh, and here are some of the highlights, right? So this is what has really worked for us, too. And we've kind of followed her, um, her prescription, and it's just worked out really well. So find a function file or library that's, you know, 50 lines of code or left, less. You know, that might be hard, but just ignore the comments and just look at the lines of code and sep uh, kind of set aside two to three minutes per line if you have a group of, of, of your team here. And try to build it first and run it. Make sure you understand what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to act and its limitations. Then start going through every line of code. Don't focus on all the details yet. Don't try to understand everything, but just try to understand the flow of the application from an application standpoint. And then start looking at the structures. Start doing a few deep dives into why, you know, how is this function uh, or how does this um, actually interact with either the database or the file system? Why is this doing this in a specific way? Why is this a static method? Um, and, and kind of looking at how somebody, what somebody's mindset was when they were creating this code. And then once you get that 
going to, into some deep dives of figuring out really why something is working and how it's working. If you don't understand it, look at the tests. If there are no tests, as a team, try to, to write some tests. Testing is something that everybody can always get better at, and the more experience that you have, the, the better. Um, and then, of course, if it's open source, you can always contribute that back and feel good. If you're looking for a first project to kind of do some code reading, almost every uh, language has a, like a .env kind of library. This is php.env, uh, and there's like a Ruby, there's Ruby env and stuff like that. Uh, this is a pretty small library, and it does one specific thing, and it's a pretty it's a pretty good read that I think um, you know it, it's a good starter. In the resources area, there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that Saran has put together. She actually has a Twitter account and stuff like that and a, and a weekly chat about reading code. And so there's lots of resources out there. Next, code reviews, right? So code reviews facilitate discussion around solutions. So this floor you know, had a nice big water spot right in the middle where there was some water damage that happened um, in the house. and this area was under a rug. No one had really kind of paid attention to it. And so now it was my job, found it after I you know, took up the rug, it's my job to fix this. This is kind of an interesting spot because I didn't know if it meant, you know, is, do I take this spot down even more? Is that going to make the floor uneven? What, what are my options here, right? And so code reviews are, the, a Microsoft, Microsoft did a study on code reviews, right? Uh, called the expectations, outcomes, and challenges of modern code review. So the study, it studied how code reviews were being done, what was the expectations, and what was the outcomes, right? So everyone initially thought that code reviews were specifically to find bugs and to, and to kind of eliminate bugs in code before it got put into production. What they found was that code reviews really not, um, facilitate knowledge transfer, increase team awareness, and alternative solutions to problems. This is really what came out of code reviews. Uh, when they looked at all of the data of what went in, all of the comments, all of the actual output, uh, it actually didn't reduce a ton of bugs. It actually just kind of built this team morale, and it drove a higher standard of coding, because every team member knew that their code was, was going to be looked at by the entire team. So what to review in a pull request? I'm of the, uh, of the mindset that you should add more people to a pull request than potentially you, you would need. Uh, so if it's a back-end code or it's, uh, it's a front-end code, in, in, uh, invite the, the opposite team, right? So have back-end developers on front-end changes and vice versa because everybody has something to bring to the table. Even if they're not directly going to be, under, they're not gonna directly understand every piece of code, they may say, oh, well, you know, you're naming this, this variable, you know, courses, but on the front-end here, I'm, I'm labeling it, um, you know, credits or something like that. Like, why, can we have these two variables be the same thing so that way they have a one-to-one -one relationship? Th things like that will come out of uh, these types of discussions. So what I look for, when I mean, if you don't already do uh, pull, re pull request code reviews, is two things if, if you're going to look for anything, right? It's the single responsibility principle and naming. Uh, and so I'm not going to go too much into the solid principles, but single responsibility principle is the, the first uh, this is the first S in solid, right? And it basically means that everything should have one purpose and one purpose only. And then, of course, naming. These are two things to always look for. The other thing to ensure that the entire team knows is that tests should be covering QA. And it's not the reviewer's responsibility to catch bugs in code. This is something that will trip up almost every development team because as long, you know, if something gets merged in or somebody, you know, something gets approved and it gets merged in and somebody finds a bug down the road, it's easy to say, well, John approved it, you know, he, he didn't notice this bug and so it, it's kind of putting the onus on the reviewer. If everybody knows that it's not their job as the reviewer to find bugs, if they find one, yes, comment on it, but it's not, that's not the goal of a pull request. The pull request is to facilitate solutions. Uh, they'll be more likely to uh, 
uh, to comment. And so I always like to think of leaving a place better than you found it, right? That's something that I always look for in a, a pull request to make sure that any code that's being added to the system is, is, is helping the system out. So authoring a pull request, making sure that the code that's being put in is a small atomic change. It shouldn't be you know, a half-baked thing of one thing and another feature that is, is fully done. It should just be that one little teeny feature. And take, you know, so taking 10 minutes or so to write up a good description of why this change is happening. You may have spent an hour on the code change. You can take 10 minutes to explain the context of why this needs to happen, not just what is happening. You know, if you're using Bitbucket or, or GitHub or other tools, the, the diffs are right there, right? That's what you're reviewing. You know what is actually changing. Knowing why it's changing will help facilitate a, a better discussion. So having like two paragraphs of that context. And then only using these kind of commands, like fixes this bug number, uh, as an actual like command at the bottom of the pull request and not as an excuse not to put the description in the top of it. Uh, because then you know, it doesn't help anybody if they have to click, they go read something else, it might have nothing fully to do with it. And so there's another, um, there's actually a RailsConf talk specifically about uh, pull requests uh, that'll be linked up in the resources too that, that kind of goes far more in depth about it. So for example, here's one that uh, doesn't provide a lot of um, text as context, but there's a video, uh, quick cast if you, or quick vid if you don't use that. It allows you to you know, take a screencast really quickly of your screen or something, and then it automatically uploads it and gives you a share URL. It's super useful for small stuff like this, and it provides a screenshot. Here's a little bit longer um, one that kind of explains a little bit more about uh, what's happening, how to test it, why it's happening, and, and stuff like that. The other thing that we've kind of really um, decided upon is using get, um, so we used to have a different branching strategies for all of our branches. It used to be like by person's name or by whatever, it was crazy. Uh, we ended up consolidating it all down to using get flow, uh, which is kind of a branching strategy that's a standard, and I'll talk about that in a second. So on the reviewer's end, this is another important, um, you know, an opportunity for everyone to be part of a cre creating kind of more solid code within uh, your environment so that way if there is changes down the road, they're easy to, to make. So using, using a method of asking and not telling. So can this be refactored a little bit more? Can this be exported to a service? Um, and this is what you'll see in, in lots of recommendations for pull requests. There is you know, a negativity bias in text communication and so uh, in written communication and so it is Often better to, when you ask a question, it doesn't look like you're, it's like a demand or, um, or, or anything like that. It also fosters a technical discussion. I've been trying to remove the word just from my vocabulary completely because it only then pushes on that button of the person who is getting that feedback if you use the word just. Uh, you know, why didn't you just make this a service? Or why didn't you just use this library? It's just, not <laughs> a good way of approaching you know, a collaborative environment. And being positive, thanking users you know, or uh, developers for a contribution to the code base, whether you agree with it or not, and then asking more questions about why they implemented a specific way will only continue to foster that discussion and come up with a far better solution. So refactoring, now I, I got my, uh, you know, sanded down that water spot, and now I needed to, I looked at it, and I didn't, I didn't have a picture of the before, but there was some huge gaps of where these, um, these boards had shrunk. And so I needed to kind of fill those gaps with something and kind of change the shape of what the floor looked like. Because as soon as I put that stain on it, it would have looked like these, you know, kind of uh, railroad tracks coming through the, um, through the uh, wood here. And so that's where refactoring comes into play, right? Taking something and starting to kind of make, uh, ensuring it's the same thing, but just kind of adding a little bit more polish, right? So the solid principles, if you're not um, kind of used to these already, they are 
the single responsibility principle, open, closed, Liskov, uh, substitu or Liskov substitution, interface segregation, and dependency inversion. I'm not going to go through all of these because they're kind of more core um, principles about specific code, but if you focus on single responsibility, the others will kind of come about after that. So that, so, so with a hardwood floor, there isn't a, you know, there isn't a machine that can go over the, f the whole floor and in one pass take off the current coat, level out the floor, and start, um, you know, um, uh, softening the, the floor to where it's as smooth as possible. It takes multiple passes, right? You're going to start with like a 40 grit sandpaper. You're going to get everything off possible and start leveling it. At that point, you have to clean it up. You have to analyze, now what's my next step? Do I have to level more? Or can I start you know, at a, you know, a, a higher grit, maybe 60 or 80, to start smoothing it out? And then finally down to 120, where your final sanding is you know, right before you either put on your poly or you put on your, um, your stain. And so you don't know what that process is going to be until you finish one step. And that's the same thing with refactoring. And so I'm going to show you an example here of uh, this is an eye tracking study on two pieces of code. Uh, it's not important what this actually does. It just does some calculation. But here is one piece of code that, so the user who is doing the study is trying to figure out what the end result of this piece of code is going to be. And this unrefactored piece of code is very linear and it, um, it doesn't, doesn't adhere to the single responsibility principle. This is their, the red dots are their eyes as they're looking around the code to figure it out. Uh, I'm not going to um, kind of display the whole thing, but it takes five minutes to, to figure out this first piece of code. Once it's refactored, kind of looks like this, right? We have two functions that do specific things. They take in a few variables and they return a single thing. Then down below, the actual application just uses those functions to then calculate the, the result. The difference in time from somebody, these are, these are two individuals that uh, are trying to figure this out. The difference in time to figure this out is from five minutes to two minutes. So the, the more that your code adheres to the solid principles, and the more that you refactor your code uh, to, uh, to these kind of smaller chunks of, of code, the more efficient it's going to be for you yourselves to maintain it long term and for other developers to maintain the code. Sandy Metz is probably the most popular uh, you know, developer talking about uh, refactoring. There's, she's written a ton, she's given a ton of talks, and if so, they're, they're in the resources area here. She has some general rules about code uh, after it's been refactored, right? So your class shouldn't be longer than 100 lines of code. A method shouldn't be longer than five lines. These are, she puts these as like very solid rules. <laughs> I, I find that they're, they're really good guidelines. But sometimes you do need to do a little bit more than this. And, and also, if you're not, she's specifically talking about Ruby code. Ruby has this you know, emphasis on elegance and, and kind of short syntax. And so you're able to do some stuff in singular lines, in less lines of code. Um, you shouldn't pass more than four parameters into a function. And then when you have a controller, at the end of the day, your controller should just instantiate a single uh, object and have it do something and return the result to your view. And that's uh, something that is um, pretty common in most like kind of MVC frameworks that you should always be kind of focusing on. So style guides. Style guides are, um, so I guess going back to that floor that I screwed up initially, uh, that I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't ask anybody, what ended up happening was I put on the stain and I put, on, put it on too thick. It never ended up drying. I, I took three days and uh, that stain was still sticky. After consulting with a few people who ended up, you know, who had done this in the past, which I should have done initially, uh, they basically said that I had to take mineral spirits and just take it all off and redo it. And so uh, that's what I ended up doing. That's why you kind of got, 
you know, the actual stain on pre-stained floor here. Uh, I had to take off the entire stain and redo it com completely from scratch because I, I didn't have that base uh, knowledge of understanding to be able to, to build off of. So a style guide can happen in multiple ways. There, most recommendations, uh, and I would also include myself in that recommendation, is having a repository or a wiki to hold all of this information, right? Samantha said this morning, uh, as an example, it doesn't exist if it isn't in the wiki. And that is 100% true with a style guide. This is the spot to discuss where those style things happen, right? Do we use camel case? Do we use tabs versus spaces? Like what those things, those discussions should be happening in a single spot, whether that be a wiki or a repository or something, uh, not in random pull requests throughout all of your code bases. And so, um, so we have kind of a web guides where we start kind of, and we have um, came up with these base recommendations. One of which I mentioned earlier is how to do branching and merging. We use GetFlow, which is a specific kind of branching strategy that starts out with a master and a dev branch. You have feature branches and releases that are either from that feature, uh, that from that development branch or from uh, kind of a hot fix uh, within the master branch. But we have that documented here, so somebody who's coming in knows exactly the baseline of what they should be building from. I know a lot of uh, universities have been moving over to Drupal. Drupal has all of these coding standards already published on their site. We don't use Drupal, uh, and we're kind of moving from a homegrown open source um, framework over to Laravel. Laravel uses PSR, PSR2 specifically, um, as their coding standards. And so we've adopted these standards as what we use for all projects. And it allows us to get onto the same page, right? So four spaces instead of, instead of tabs, right? How brackets are done to allow code to be uh, readable uh, as somebody is moving from project to project or file to file. This PSR is a standard that is developed by the PHP Framework Interop Group. Um, and there's a whole bunch of links in the resources area. I also put a couple other standards for, um, for Ruby, and um, I don't have anything in there for ASP, but um, I don't know. I think there already is some pretty solid standards for ASP. So the process that every team has um, has probably you know, contributed to the, the code that is in every uh, repository. But you have to start someplace. So starting with your current process, right? This floor, it's kind of scary to start, um, you know, staining a floor. Where do you start? You don't want to paint yourself into a corner. You also um, have to start someplace. You can't start in the middle. You got to start someplace. And so looking at how your team does work, what we've found is the most important thing is for your developers to know what the next most important thing is. So everything in a priority queue, everything. Where there's one queue, that is the priority. And the developers on your team, all they need to know is to pull from that top of that priority list, and that's what they're going to be working on next. Project managers, directors, anybody else on their team has to be diligent about ensuring that this priority list is up to date. So that way there isn't time wasted to figure out, should I be working on this or should I be working on that? What is the priority here? Those developers, like I mentioned in the beginning, can just take from the top of the queue and do their work. If they get stuck on something or if something is blocked, they're waiting for a client, they're waiting for somebody to do something, they can move that to the blocked column, move on to the next thing. Uh, and this, uh, this really reduces context switching. Because at the end of the day, context switching is very expensive from a developer standpoint. There is so, uh, you know, like I don't. There's a bunch of studies about how much time is lost, but it's going to depend on on every team. The but the more that you can reduce that, the better. Um, retrospectives. All right. So staff morale is key for retrospectives, right? It's why if you don't already, who does retrospectives here with their with their team or has done them in the past? Well, not, not very many, like maybe five uh, people here. So how many of you um, 
have either left a position or had a coworker leave a position because they were unhappy. All right, so that, that's, that's a pretty good chunk of you guys, 60% or so. Uh, how many of you think that could have been prevented if you know, there was time and space for that person or yourself to kind of talk about what those, those issues were? This is about, almost about the same percent. All right, so something that we have, um, and this is going to take a while, and it's going to be tough, and it's going to be rocky, and you just got to stick to it. So we do weekly retrospectives, right? And we don't we take like 15, 20 minutes. Some, in the beginning, they're longer, but they get shorter as time goes on, right? Right after lunch, because that's usually once, that's when everybody's in, and everybody has some time to then just kind of before they get back into uh, their work mode on Fridays. And we just do, very simply, we have a happy column and a sad column, right? And we talk about what went well this last week and what didn't go so well, right? So in the beginning, it'll probably look like this, a lot more in the sad column than the happy column, right? And so, but as time goes on, also, just so, for, so you know, this, these columns did switch. So uh, that last time had the uh, sad column on the left, for us, depending on who's writing on the board, is going to depend on who, where they put it. Uh, but you'll notice that these columns are going to start evening out because you'll talk about those things that um, even if you don't anticipate or don't kind of um, specifically say, all right, we're going to tackle this one thing. You might because it might be a major thing that everybody sees as an issue. But um, you know, over time, as long as you start to focus on these concerns, if you pick one, you pick a couple or just people just know about them, right? We have things in here like, you know, time tracking is inconsistent or um, innovation time is inconsistent, right? So like things that like, all right, well, we need to be conscious of this. It might not be like a specific to do. Um, over time, and these three kind of snapshots were from uh, like a year ago, middle of, you know, six months ago, and this is kind of a more recent one, right? where the positives are going to start outweighing the negatives. It will just start happening. And this time and space is here specifically to get the team to talk about potential small issues uh, and to, to build upon them. Weekly maintenance. This happens, uh, you know, weekly maintenance happens every week. So there is something. So Fridays are usually the days that we dedicate to retrospectives and doing some little bit of maintenance. Uh, and that maintenance can be something as simple as this. Like, as I was redoing these floors, the vibration of the machines and stuff like that kept bringing these three nails just like up. They just kept popping up. So almost every day I had to go and tack these things down. Eventually, because this happened you know, every day, I ended up having to uh, have my brother-in-law come and replace these with you know, like more secure nails that, um, that he knew would stick in for a long time. I didn't have that knowledge, but I enlisted him to help me. So we track all of our sites, each one has their own repository, on one big spreadsheet. We actually have a bunch of stuff at the bottom so that the developers are in this spreadsheet all of the time. This is always in their face. And this kind of gives us an understanding of where every repository is, what, you know, how it does deployment, and how all this other stuff is and what the technical debt is. This allows for the developers when they start doing weekly maintenance, just go into this document, find something to work on, whether they're the, like, the tagged developer on this project or not, and maybe make some updates or take some technical debt down. This has helped us uh, kind of move all of our projects forward incrementally, um, you know, little by little. And we actually do have a response, like I took all the developer names off here, but um, every one of our projects has at least one developer as the, the primary kind of responsibility for this site. So that way there's kind of an even distribution that isn't just, oh, just because you know, Chris did this site, he's always going to be responsible for it. No, it's it kind of, you know, just because someone did something doesn't mean that they're the only one who can touch it. All right, automation. Uh, because you know, no one wants to go and redo a, uh, a floor by hand. This would just be painful. <laughs> it, I, uh, it would take forever. 
And so there are tons of tools in place to automate as much as possible. And so for us, taking the time to set these tools up and understand them has given us more and more tool, more and more time to focus on the actual things that are important. It's discussing code and, and making sure that quality code is making it into a repository. Some of it is like, uh, so we set up uh, a Jenkins server specifically to run tests and, and to deploy sites. So that way, as soon as code is merged into the develop branch, it automatically runs its tests, and if it's cool, it, it deploys. That has helped the developers know that once they go from a code review and it gets merged in, they can move on to something else. So they don't have to wait for anybody to actually do this manually. Uh, so, you know, if there if there's a ton of different versions of this, there's um, this is a self-hosted thing, but there's a, a bunch of uh, software service options here. Generators. So like I mentioned about the style guide, starting with a baseline, a generator for specific things or specific projects helps people get up and going quickly. We use Yoman to, uh, if you're not familiar with Yoman, even if you don't have, um, you know, aren't doing JavaScript heavy stuff, it is, you know, a node kind of package that, um, that may be, it may take a little bit of time to set up initially, but the time savings is well worth it. So we have the ability to like build a base website, right? So our actually our front end uh, our designers have will do wireframes in code, and this allows them to just you know name the site, and boom, it it builds a base site for them to start adding stuff to. But instead of them having to find the most recent files and copy them over to a directory, rename a whole bunch of stuff. The script takes care of all of that for them. All right, code formatting. So this, you, it's hard to see here. Uh, these are actually two rooms done at two different times because everyone in this house was still living in this house while I was redoing these floors, so I couldn't do the entire thing at the same time. Um, this floor down below, see how it's a little uneven and it kind of, it's okay, works, it's functional, uh, but it's got a little bit of, inconsistency in it compared to the upper floor, which you know was after me doing three or four rooms, and I got really good at the stain stuff. <laughs> um, I, as soon as I got really good at it, I wasn't going to go back and redo those first one or two rooms that maybe don't look super polished. And that's the same with your code. You know, as soon as you learn something new, you're not always gonna have the time at this second to go back and redo all of that work in, in previous projects. And so for us, what's important is uniformity uh, on that project compared to uni uniformity with every single project. And so the easiest way to do that is to ensure that every project has like an editor config file. If you don't have these already in your projects, it allows you to define specific file types. You can do an individual file name or any like markdown file or any file in general as a default. Uh, and you can have different specs about how the, your editor should be treating this code. So that way, you know it'll always trim you know, any extra lines uh, or any extra spaces off of every line or always add a new line at the end of the file. Stuff like that will always just be happening, na happening naturally. I use PHP as an example here just because it's in our environment. Uh, you can also automatically co fix uh, style things with uh, within your code. There are a ton of these things out here. This one specifically is for PSR format, uh, but there are other ones for Drupal formatted code and stuff like that. Um, this allows you to install via Composer and then run this, fix a specific directory for whatever level. There's a couple levels of PSR. Uh, you can do a dry run. You can see the difference and everything. And it allows you to either see the diff, so that way you can go and clean it up by yourself by hand, or if you take off dry run, it'll just go and reformat your code automatically for you. And so depending on how your team is set up, how you want to handle that, if you just want to trust this tool, you can totally do that. And that's usually what's recommended. There's also a bunch of, um, in the resources area, like software as service tools that will, every time you commit to a repository, look at the code and make sure it fits specific style. But the better part is, is fixing that code before it even gets into the repository. So using get hooks to have pre-commit hooks is specifically where we found the most benefit. So that way 
like crufty code doesn't just get into the repository. Someone has to clean it up or revert it back out and, and, and do stuff like that. Uh, recommending to have all your, all your Git hooks in their own repository so that way you can just system link them in to uh, that project's hooks directory so that way you don't have to have duplicate code all throughout. Uh, this is what, uh, this way those hooks can be consistent throughout all of your projects. And the other thing to make sure is that you, if you do pre-commit hooks, make sure you stash before running those hooks. So making sure that no code that isn't, that just so happens to be, you know, like not yet finished, not yet staged to get in the repository is out of the way before you start doing formatting or before you start running tests and stuff like that. There's also a way to, uh, to skip the hook by doing a dash dash no verify. And if you want to set up some aliases for this, that's also recommended to save some keystrokes, save some time. All right, measuring results. Uh, this is this, the last section here. Um, this is how much uh, sawdust wood came off of that one floor uh, from the beginning. There was a lot. It took uh, three days of sanding um, after kind of leveling it all out, getting it all the way down to the fine, um, smooth floor before I could put on the stain. That's a, lot, that's a lot of wood that came off in three days. Uh, it didn't all come off at once, but it, it eventually got here as I, as I was working through. So say we take the time, um, time lapse of a year. This is a general project from a year ago. This is how bad we were at estimating our, our projects and how much we had to fix stuff as we were working through a project, right? We were over our time budget on ev almost everything, right? Architecture, not because that, they're just dealing with Word documents and spreadsheets, right? Um, six months then of committing to working as a team, doing code reviews, doing retrospectives, putting these hooks in place, fixing our code standards, we got a little bit better, right? So we were you know, not over by too much and we almost hit some of these deadlines. And then more recently, we've been hitting all of our estimates for our projects. Uh, because when developers and uh, both front end, back end, uh, and the designers start to do their, their wireframes and stuff, the code all feels the same through the entire process. If there's a question at any point in time, everybody's talking about it. Then, you know, when somebody is looking for a piece of code, it's from a generated source originally. So it's not just like, oh, what, um, you know, this, this developer or this designer just decided to do uh, for this project. And so, at the end of the day, it's all about tiny habits. These little teeny things that are done every single day, it's not gonna come from management, right? There isn't a, a way for somebody to, to ensure this all happens. These things have to come from the ground up to make sure that they're part of the, kind of the flow of everyday work within, within a group and to ensure that these things are happening. Um, at the end of the day, the, the code isn't going to write itself. It does take an entire team. And there, the more that you can talk um, about solutions and the, the trade-offs of one thing or another, the better quality code is gonna go into, into your projects. Um, and so there's this, if you're not familiar with the term of Kaizen, it's continuous improvement. Um, it, is, it basically means just, just taking where you're at right now and just always looking to improve a little bit every single time. And that's kind of how we look at making more efficient and more, um, more solid code and it has helped immensely by not specifically looking at um, doing things over and over but putting these structures in place. Uh, thank you. <laughs>